Hello, and welcome to devlog number 32. Phase 3 of Conquest development was officially completed about mid-January. And amazingly, Phase 4, which is industry and construction, is about 50% done already. Once Phase 4 is done, that's going to be the vast majority of all of the systems and mechanics that are required for this game mode. But, even though I'll be able to say soon that most of the game mechanics are implemented, it's still far from done. Because of the complexity of this game mode, bug fixing and polishing and balancing is going to be by far the longest part of the development process instead of just implementing the features the way it has been for the previous updates. Some of you may have seen the testing lobbies running for Conquest in the Match Browser, and I promise you, you don't need to be too jealous of them because right now things are very buggy and the testers probably can only go about five minutes before they have to pause their game and start writing a GitHub report for me. But if you can't wait and you really want to subject yourself to that, if you didn't see on the main Discord, we released a call for testers for our first wave of official Conquest testers. Those applications are going to remain open until the evening of February 29th, so if you're interested, you can go fill that form out, and I'll leave a link to it in the video description. So with those logistics out of the way, let's talk about actual logistics. I mentioned in the last devlog that there were still two things that needed to be done for Phase 3. Something I've been seeing for a long time in the comments and discussions on Discord and the forums is, I hope they're going to add replenishment ships, I hope they add logistics ships, etc. Even interestingly on the last video where I mentioned them several times, and the only response that I can have for that is, oh ye of little faith, who do you think I am? So let me introduce you to the Mercator class replenishment oiler. This is another excellent Papa Panda design and it's going to serve as the backbone for all of your fleet logistics. It's quite a large hull compared to all of the warships because it's designed to carry tons of fuel, tons of ammunition and supplies and stores. You can see how big it is compared to the Axford here. We wanted to make sure with the design that even though this ship isn't going to be animated and actually function to replenish ships in the skirmish battle, it still looked as functional as possible like it could actually work. The way it's designed to work is that it's got these docking clamps on the sides and they're adjustable, they slide around for whatever the size of the ship it's replenishing is, and they'll lock into these clamp receivers that you see on the hulls. Uh, we've been thinking about this for a long time so all the decals are there to make it um, operate correctly. And then the cargo comes up through these decks in the center and the arms will pick it up and carry it over to the ship and either, you know, install it in the VLS or carry it into the cargo hatch or whatever. And then down here, we've got these two fuel booms that will plug into the fuel port and pump fuel across. In real life, obviously, all these things are done by stringing cables across and having the two ships move in unison. But a lot of that is really dependent on there, you know, being gravity, which we don't have here. So robotic arms and clamps were the way that we decided to go with it. It does have some very limited mounting points as well, so it can defend itself. It has a class 1 underneath the bow and a class 1 on top, and then a class 2 at the back. But that's just for self-defense. It's really not meant to get into any kind of combat. We also have an OSP oiler design on the way that's going to be using the gas freighter concepts from the update that we didn't end up using. That's not done or in the game right now because we're doing only the Alliance faction first because there's going to be requirements to getting a faction to be compatible with Conquest and I'm not going to do it parallel for both factions at the same time when I can just figure it out with the Alliance and then do it all for the OSP later. And just to tease you a little bit, we do have one other Conquest specific hull in the works per faction, but I'll show that to you in its due time. So the Euler has a really cool design for when you're in skirmish and you're trying to protect or you're trying to destroy the enemies but all of its actually cool mechanics take place on the Conquest map. The first of those is providing fuel to the rest of the task force. So we can see that we have Task Force Ash here, which has 11 warships and one auxiliary. And let's take this task force and we're gonna move it over to Animer. It's quite a long trip. Warships could make this on their own because keep in mind that fuel equals speed, not necessarily range. But if we want our attack to get there in a reasonable amount of time, we need an oiler to give us that burn capability. So you can see on the fuel report that as I change the burn times, it draws mostly from the oiler at first, but then when it hits about 10% reserve, it starts to burn into the warship's fuel storage. It actually took quite a lot of time to figure out an efficient way to do this because you don't want to just drain the oiler all the way down from the start and then start burning into the warships because then you won't have any fuel to send the oiler somewhere if you need to. You also might have noticed that the fuel numbers were quite a bit larger than they were in the last devlog, and we'll talk about that later. The other really big benefit that these oilers are going to give you is the ability to reload ammo for ships without having to go back to port. This allows you to sustain offensives far from your bases, but it also makes these ships gigantic juicy targets for the enemy, where they can just sink your entire task force worth of ammo in one shot. So if we open up the replenishment planner here, we can see a list of all of our ships on the left-hand side. 
it shows me all of their fuel and ammo conditions. They're all currently at 100% because I haven't spent any ammo or fuel from this task force yet. Normally, you're not going to need to replenish fuel for ships because they're all going to draw from the oiler anyway, because it's just simpler that way. The reason that this exists is so that you can top off ships before you, say, detach a task group to go do something else. So I'll choose ammo and fuel replenishment for these two ships and apply and they'll show up on the schedule. And then I can edit their ammo requisition and their fuel requisition the same way I would do if they were in port. And again, since they're all at 100%, I'm going to take things off instead just to demonstrate this. So basically, this thing just acts like a mobile supply station. It even uses the same systems under the hood just to keep it all uniform and consistent. And then there's also some quick options in the bottom left, so you can rearm none or rearm anything with less than 33% or rearm anything less than 66% or rearm all, and same for fueling. The other thing remaining to be done from phase three is the ability to actually capture everything around a planet. Previously, stations were invulnerable and planets would capture instantly as soon as you took high orbit. Now, planets have a hierarchy of POIs that need to be captured, and capturing them is a multi-step process. So now, when my task force here arrives at Garnet, I'm going to get prompted with the hierarchy of points of interest that I can capture, and I'll be able to choose where I actually want the battle to occur. And a pretty big quality of life improvement here is being able to actually see the planet's orbit and everything that's present. Anyway, on the right here at the top, you can see the list of all the points of interest and the hierarchy of how they're represented. So high orbit is meant to be the route. When you arrive to attack a place, you will have to capture high orbit first before you can capture anything else. And because it's the only thing that I can capture right now, since everything else is locked, it's going to be selected by default. And then below that, we have the contested landing, which is where we'll actually capture the planet itself, and then all the stations that are in orbit over the planet as well. Here you can see it says your team has the initiative. The way it works is that the attacker will start with the initiative, and then from then on, whoever wins the last battle gets to choose the location of the next until there are no more opposing forces. This works similarly for uncontested captures, so if my forces arrive at a point of interest that has no enemy forces, I'll just get to pick which of the points of interest I want to capture immediately, but with the same limitations, so I'd have to capture high orbit before I can move on to any of the stations, for example. Right now, capturing a POI is instantaneous, but that will change in the future once the invasion mechanics are more fleshed out in Phase 5. At this point in development, I've been trying really hard to stay away from any serious balance discussion because there's so much unimplemented and there's so much that's going to change and there's so many bugs that throw things off that it's really not worth it. But there is one thing that has come up in our test games that we've been playing that is so obvious that we really can't ignore it. And that obvious thing is travel times. The base acceleration values for the ships was chosen so that it would take about one to two months to cross the whole system. Which in the scheme of a scenario like Great Powers is not that long, it's just a couple turns. But that does kind of leave a problem with a scenario like Minor Powers, where everything's crammed into this tiny moon system. With those acceleration values, it takes less than a day, and certainly less than a turn, to travel between basically any two moons. In the current minor power scenario, this is annoying because mostly you're playing reactively. You can't see an enemy unit coming and move a task force to intercept them at a planet, for example. But in great powers, this is going to be even worse because most of the things that you're doing are going to be taking place on seven day turns at the full solar system scale. And so anything that's happening in a moon system is just going to be going by in the blink of an eye. So we've done an experiment where we've scaled the acceleration of ships based on whether or not they're in a moon system. So, for example, if the scaling in the Joule's Rest system is 25%, then that means that it's going to go from 1 to 2 days to fly between any two moons to 2 to 5 days. Fuel consumption also goes proportionally down, which is why the fuel numbers have jumped up so much, so that the burn rates could go up and give me more granular control of fuel consumption, because I can only ever consume full units of fuel. On the other hand, traveling between planets goes at 100% acceleration, so let's say it takes about 23 to 25 days to travel from Joule's Rest to Animer. This means that where we had previously a 1 to 25 ratio of moon distance to planet distance, it's now about a 1 to 5 ratio, which equalizes things quite a bit. Does it make the most realistic sense? Probably not, and we could probably come up with excuses if we need to for why it is this way, but the bottom line is that this is an experiment to try to make things more fun by equalizing timeframes across the different scales of the system, and right now the results are really positive. One other balance change that I've made so far is that when I increased all the fuel storages, I also increased the burn rates, but I didn't increase them proportionally. So if I remove this oiler from this task force and send it over to Topaz, we can see that the fuel consumptions have been rebalanced for the different ships so that there's kind of a bell curve 
So battleships will consume proportionally more fuel compared to their fuel bunkers than something like a frigate. So fuel efficiency will peak around the frigate and destroyer class, giving them more freedom of action for raiding parties without needing an oiler with them, whereas capital ships like battleships and heavy cruisers are going to need an oiler if they're going to go any substantial distance. Hull types also now have different acceleration rates, with the Sprinter and the Vauxhall having the highest acceleration, and the Solomon obviously having the lowest. All right, with all that out of the way, we can finally start talking about the Phase 4 stuff, which is industry and full logistics. Up in the top bar here, we've got our industrial resources on the left and our operational resources on the right. And those are common metals, rare metals, polymers, parts, fuel, and then provisions are not yet implemented, and ammunition. This button over here is going to control the scope of whatever's in these bars. So we can go from full system to the local planetary system, or we can go to just the planet that we're looking at right now, and you'll see that the numbers adjust as we change what our current zoom scope is. That's not the most useful right now because everything is confined to the Jules Rest system, so the system and the planetary system are really the same. Clicking on any one of these will bring up a breakdown of not only all of the subtypes of this resource category and its counts, but also the locations where they can all be found. We can do that for ammunition as well and see all of our different ammo types as well as the locations where they're stored, and we can double click on them to go to that location. An important thing to note is that the numbers that you see at the top are actually a point value summary. All of these resources have a point value assigned to them to help me out with balancing, and it also makes it so that your 444,000 rounds of 20 millimeter slugs doesn't make the number at the top huge and effectively useless for you to know how much ammo you really have without opening up the breakdown. There's been a bunch of new stations added, and if we pull back, we can see that this will be the full extent of the minor power scenario here. I've also added these L points, so the system supports L1 through 5, although only 3, 4, and 5 have been placed for both Jules Rest and Acarus. The reason for that is that they're the stable points where asteroids tend to congregate, so they make sense for mining stations. For this new station adding pass, I've added three new types of stations. We have mining, refinery, and factory stations. Let's start by zooming all the way back into Jules Rest, and we'll take a look at Gas Platform 1. We can go to the information for this station, and we can see under the industry tab that we have a production line here for the gas harvester, which is going to produce 5,000 fuel every hour. And then under that, you can see that we have two active outbound shipping routes, which are going to send 400,000 fuel out to these stations every two days. But we're going to talk about routes in depth in a second. Going all the way back out to Jewel L5, we can see that we have two mining stations here. If we take a look at one of them, we can see that it has a common metal, asteroid miner and a rare metal asteroid miner. And then it's also going to be shipping those raw materials to the two refineries at both Jade and Sapphire. Next, we'll hop on over to the refinery at Sapphire. Here we have a common metals refinery and a rare metals refinery. And you can also see the inbound shipments coming from the mining platforms. You'll notice that both of these are missing their inputs as well because the shipments haven't arrived yet and they've burned through their starting resources. One thing that's weird here is that it's outputting polymers as part of the common metals refining process. The reason for that is that I need a way to generate them somehow, and in the real case, they're going to be coming from planets, and I haven't implemented the planet production nodes yet. The reason I haven't implemented them yet is because there's a lot to do for planets that's going to come in phase 5, and I don't want to have to implement it twice, so this is the stopgap for now. Pulling all the way back out again, we have these overlay buttons in the top right-hand corner, and these control basically how the map looks. By flipping over to the logistics view, we can inspect all of our logistics network at the same time. In this mode, we can see these green lines representing all of our shipments or space lines of communication, showing where and how and what direction different materials are moving. By hovering over any of these lines, we can see a quick tooltip showing us the origin, destination, whether it's a routine shipment, what the schedule is, and what materials it's carrying. We can even right click on one of the lines if we want to edit or delete the route, although keep in mind that a deleted route isn't actually going to disappear until the last cargo ship has been unloaded at the destination, and then the route will go away. All of the routes that you're seeing here are set up automatically by the scenario, so you don't need to worry about the tedium of going from the mining stations to the refineries to the factories every time you start a new game. So let's go ahead and add a shipment from the Jade Refinery to the Emerald Factory. I can do that in two ways. The first is by opening up the station's information page and going to the bottom of the industry tab, and then I have this add shipment button. 
but a much more intuitive and visual way is to just draw the line on the map. So I can add a logistics route here and drag it from Jade to the Emerald Factory, and it brings up this shipment manifest. Initially, it's limited to just the things that are on the station because that's probably what I want to be shipping, although I can uncheck this and I can send anything that I want to it. If it is available on the station, it'll be sent. So let's plug in some numbers here for what we want to send for common metals, rare metals, and polymers. I can also change the schedule of these shipments so I can set them every X number of days or I can only do it when the manifest is fully loaded. And I can make this shipment either routine or one time by unchecking this box. Routine is gonna repeat indefinitely and one time is gonna make it so that once this ship is loaded and sent off, the route is automatically gonna be cut. And then once I click apply, it'll create the new route and you can see it appear on the map. And now I'll go ahead and execute the turn so that you can see this whole thing work. Once the turn starts executing, you'll see a cargo ship gets allocated to it and begins loading up and then will depart and begin flying over to its destination. These routes effectively have an unlimited number of cargo ships available to them, although they can only send one ship per route per day. The reason for that is that I just really didn't want to make it so players had to micromanage their cargo ships and worry about building them and taking up berth space for what could be used for warships. And then once it arrives, you can see that it begins unloading at the destination and then it just gets despawned. One thing that bothers me a lot about this is that there's a lot of text here on this shipments information list. The reason for that is that this is still obviously very early development and there's going to be things that change. I want to clean this up a lot, add icons to increase its brevity and make it a little more readable. The whole UI is kind of like that. I like the general way it looks and apparently a lot of other people do too. It's very utilitarian. But right now there's not a lot of uniformity, it's very cluttered, and the reason for that is that I'm just kind of trying things out and seeing what I like and experimenting with the way things can look. Once phase four is done, I'm gonna do an actual pass on the UI, come up with a style sheet and a design guide and something that looks coherent, and then go ahead and implement all that on all the different windows. Anyway, the final step in our chain here is the factory stations. So if we open up the information for Emerald Factory, we can see that we have six production lines here. By expanding one of these accordions, I get the configuration page and I can see the list of all the recipes that are available to me. And I can select this missile type and I will see all of the inputs that are necessary to make it and what the output is, is just one missile. Similarly, I can configure all the different assembly lines to produce different things like an active decoy and it's got a different production requirement list. I click the reconfigure button to start for the next turn the reconfiguration of this assembly line and note that it does take a significant amount of time to do that. The batch size is not only ever one though, so I can select the 250 ammo and you can see that I'm gonna output 100 rounds at the end of the cycle. When it comes to intermediate resources like parts, I can either dedicate an assembly line to producing the one specific type of parts or I can have a recipe for bulk parts which will take more resources and slightly more time, but will also produce everything. So I'm basically trading resources and time in order to free up assembly lines. And again, it needs to be stated, all of these numbers are subject to balance changes down the line. This is obviously a lot of things to have to click through. So I made sure that it was all in one central place as well. So you can go to this industry production lines and you can see every station that has any kind of producing um, node and then you can configure it from here as well. So you don't need to go to the individual stations. You can just monitor all the progress from here. So that is the whole industry system minus the planet production nodes, but those are just gonna look exactly like stations. Yes, it's a lot of stuff, but I wanna be clear that the goal here is not to turn this into nebulous factorio command. If you haven't read the concept document, the reason why the system exists like this is to form this complex web of vulnerability that a team that's on the back foot can exploit, send out raiding parties to attack mining stations and sever logistics lines without having to face the main larger enemy fleet in battle. It creates a lot of different things that you can split up your forces and send to attack and also makes it so that concentrating all of your forces in one place to death ball them isn't the optimal solution because you can't defend the massive number of points that you have to. If you aren't defending your mining stations or your gas platforms or your refineries or whatever, then yes, there's some inertia in the logistics system or in the industry system where even if you capture the station, the cargo ships that have already left are still going to go and do and deliver whatever they were supposed to deliver. But if you let it stay for too long, then eventually your giant battleship blob is going to starve. Next, I'm going to show you the ship blueprint manager. 
So this gives us a list of all of the designs for the ships that we have. And right now, these are only the starting designs that I created the faction with at the start of the game. So right here, we've got this support frigate, which is a class that I started the game with. You can see it's fitting and everything. And I'm gonna add a new gun frigate design. You'll notice a difference between the two classes is that the support frigate has the green new construction marker and the gun frigate has a red one. The reason for that is that the support frigate is a class I started the game with. I already have a bunch in my navy, so obviously the new construction blueprint is already going to be researched. But I'm going to need to research anything I want to do with the gun frigate. And I wanted to take a more unique approach with research in this game because honestly, I really hate research tech trees and strategy games. I wanted research here to be much more about adapting to the enemy and tuning your designs and shifting your strategy. So there are two types of research for ships. There's new construction and refit. Because I already have a bunch of frigate hulls built, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna research a refit blueprint from the support frigate, which is the only other frigate design that I have, to the gun frigate. The amount of time it takes to research the refit plan is actually related to the number of sockets that have changed. So it just happens to round out to an even 24 hours here. And then I'm also gonna add research for the construction plan so that I can build a new gun frigate from scratch in the shipyard. So I let that run through for a turn, and now we're going to go ahead and turn one of our support frigates into a gun frigate. The first thing we're going to need to do in order to do that is to find a frigate that's at the shipyard that I want to change. So we're going to take this one and enter it into port, and we're going to put it in a graving dock. When I open up the berth schedule, you can see nothing's actually scheduled for this ship already. So I'll right click it, and then I'll edit the refit order. Now I'm going to select the gun frigate because it's the only one that I can refit to because it's the only other frigate class and it shows me all the materials that it's going to take in order to do this refit. And if these resources aren't present and it's going to draw them at a regular rate, then it's going to stall the work and it's going to back up everything else behind it. So you can see now that this refit is actually pretty simple, so it's going to go in less than a day. But refitting larger ships is going to take quite a bit of time if a lot of sockets are changing. I definitely do want to keep these refit times short though when compared to new construction so that things are much more focused on changing your existing ships around to, to make adjustments compared to what the enemy is bringing instead of just pumping out new designs. And then we can also go to the shipyard production manager and I can add a new light cruiser to the queue. And once the berth schedule refreshes, you can see how long it takes to build the cruiser compared to refitting an existing frigate. There's also a missile blueprint manager, but it's pretty much exactly the same thing, but with no distinction between the research types. So we're not going to show that. And then the last thing that we've got from a logistics perspective is loadout editing. Loadouts are basically presets for what ammo types and quantities go on a specific ship design. It's a lot simpler, both from a design and a gameplay perspective to create these presets instead of having you be able to do individual bespoke ammo counts for each individual ship. So we'll take the standard combat load for the skirmish cruiser and duplicate it and rename it to this half load. And then I'll just cut all the ammo values in half as an example. And then once that's done, I can apply the changes and I can set this loadout on any ship that I want. I can also edit the values for loadouts that ships are already using and it will update the values that are targeted for that ship, but it's not gonna change any actual ammo values. Although ships that are in port doing ammo transfer will have their work updated. And it'll give you warnings if you make any changes to loadouts that ships are currently using. For example, if you delete a loadout that ships are using, it'll say there are four ships using this loadout. And if you delete it, then it will revert all of them to their standard combat load. So here I've put one of our cruisers into port and I'm gonna change its ammo requisition to use the half load. And you can see that all the ammo counts are now greater than what they should be. So it's gonna schedule a bunch of work to remove that extra ammo from the ship. And then to round all this out, we've got the beginning of the Intel mechanics. The very beginning of that is better track management, and I'm not gonna spoil anything beyond this because I've got a lot of cool ideas that I'm gonna be experimenting with over the next few weeks. So we're gonna watch this enemy cargo ship leave gas platform two, and it's automatically tagged as a neutral right now because there's no mechanics for the players to determine what things are. So I'm just automatically tagging cargo ships as neutral and warships as suspect. The yellow circles are radar ranges, and you'll notice that even though the ship has left our radar range, we can still see it. The reason for that is that it's burning away from us, and so we can see its drive flare, and now it's flipped over and it's burning for deceleration, so it gets this little X on it, which means that we've lost the track. And that track is going to continue to get dead reckoned out based on its last position and velocity. Now the dead reckoning is going to carry that cargo ship off the edge of the picture-in-picture -picture exploded view for Jules Rest, but by the end of this turn we're going to have these two additional cargo ships here that are going to end up being lost tracks. The picture in picture may have been confusing for some people when I posted the video of it in the Discord, but I've added a couple additional features to maybe make it a little clearer. 
for example, this kind of lensing effect around the area of influence for Jules Rest, but there's also a true scale option if you do find it confusing. I personally like the exploded view because I think it makes the system a lot more readable at a greater scale, because when you pull back out and you go to true scale, like look at this mess of things that are at Jules Rest, who can even read that? I just think it makes it look better, but if you don't like it, there is true scale. I also added some quick tagging options for tracks because I noticed that players just weren't changing the track labels at all because the previous way you had to do it was you had to go to the edit track window and type in a label and choose an allegiance and that's just very tedious so they just leave all the tracks as unevaluated but now you can just click one of these quick tag options to change it. Now it's obvious that as the game progresses with all these lost tracks being dead reckoned out it's going to get very cluttered very quickly. So a lost track is going to be automatically maintained until the end of the execution phase. So the next tasking phase starts and then you can see all the lost tracks and you can evaluate them as you need to. When the next execution phase starts, any lost track is going to be automatically dropped unless that track is labeled tactically significant or taxig. Suspect tracks are going to be automatically taxigged unless you choose not to. And then all these neutral cargo ship tracks are going to get automatically dropped when they're lost. If you really care about one though, you can right click it and mark it as taxig and then it's not going to get dropped. Once the intel mechanics are more further developed, there's going to be rules for determining how things are marked initially by the system. So for example, a track that's detected leaving an enemy held planet is automatically going to be tagged as suspect, and then it's up for the intel officer to look at it and determine what it is, and label it as hostile if it is. So that's it for this update. Next I'll be finishing up intel mechanics over the next couple of weeks, and opening up the full ECOTA system for the great power scenario, hopefully just in time for us to take on all our new testers in early March. The current testers are telling me they've been having a great time despite all the bugs. The game loop is solid. I just need to keep it that way and continue making improvements. So if you're interested, don't forget to apply to be a tester in the link in the description, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.